Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. But I'm excited that as a church, we are answering the call. You know, we're not a big church. Do you understand that? And to hear that a nation, because it's a nation that's being transformed. It's a city that is being transformed. It's, it's a, a country that is being transformed because someone was crying out to God. And then we decided to respond. We decided to say, hey, how much do we have? Zero. Okay, we're going. And, and then God is going to provide. God, if, if we're waiting for the finances to come, we will still be waiting to open this church. And so we know that God has met the need. And thank you for your generous giving. The people are excited. The people can't believe that there is a church in California, in the city of New Hall, a main name, that's this little tiny church that is feeding thousands of people, that is giving hope to them. So we are extremely uh, proud, and that's the word that I can convey to you, but I know that God is extremely pleased with all of you. So we will continue on uh, Shark Week, uh, and I always have uh, subtitles if you come on a Wednesday night. So I decided my subtitle will be Sharknado. You like it? You didn't see the movie, right? And if you don't like it, you could go find Nemo. It, you take either way, right? I never saw Sharknado. I just thought it was an idiotic movie. Like, how are they coming out, you know? And I was thinking about the fear that we all have. Like, all this fear, I believe that we're not doing the things that God has asked us to do because we are so afraid of fear. We are afraid of the unknown, like, I'm afraid of sharks. Uh, when I put them on, I was like, oops. You know, I had to pray in the spirit. <laughs> but when I was in Mexico, and I know my husband brought that little, like, the jaws, and I'm like, I felt sorry for the shark, you know. But he probably would have prepared it. I would have ate it. But I feel still afraid for a sorry. But there's some stats why we shouldn't be afraid of sharks. We could get now we can... We're going to debunk the liar. Sharks should be afraid of us. And I'm going to prove you. Okay, so can we start with the number one? This is the number one? Okay. Mosquitoes kill. Okay, sharks kill one person per year around the world. Do you understand? One person per year around the world a shark only kills one person and we are so afraid of the shark two mosquitoes kill six thousand five and five hundred fifty five thousand people per year i think someone should be telling us those facts i was in mexico not too long ago and i looked like like i had chicken pox Somebody could have told me you could have died, Virginia, because they could have just get some sweet, sweetness of you. I came back, and I'm like, now you tell me. But you know when you're called, you're not going to get killed by a mosquito. Um, next. Hippos kill 2,900 people per year, and to think that I always wanted to have a hippo at home. And it's because they're moody. All right, next one. Deer kill 130 people per year. Delicious, but they're killing people and we're eating them. It's a tray, you know? Next. Bees kill 53 people per year. You eat the honey, they kill you. Right? Okay. Next. Dogs kill 30 to 35 people per year. Not my dog because he's a sweetheart. I don't know about yours. Snakes, ugh, ugly, kill five people per year. Next. Sharks kill one person per year. 
and a hundred million sharks die per year by who? So who's that Sharknado? You are. We are killing. We are killing the sharks, and yet we are afraid of them. Do you understand that? That's how the enemy works. The enemy cannot do nothing to us. But what is it? Where are we getting our information? I mean, I mean, growing up, you know, it's funny, right? Because they tell you, like, um, well, you know that I'm Salvadorian. And um, so when they, when they want to, I don't know why parents want to make your children afraid to obey. Have you ever noticed that? I don't know if the only Hispanics or other, uh, other cultures do that. So if they want you to go to sleep, they tell you, go to sleep. If not, the mano peluda is going to take you. <laughs> do, do you know what a mano peluda is? It's a hairy hand, which I have one. If you don't go to sleep, the mano peluda te va a llevar. And, they, and you're like, oh, my gosh, the mano peluda. I, I, my kids ask me, how did it look? I don't know. It's just, I don't know how the mano peluda looks, but it takes children. <laughs> and you need to go to bed. Right? We're trying to teach our kids to obey, but we are still in fear in them. Right? In Mexico, because I am a part Mexican, because I love my Mexican family, they tell you, el, el cucuy te va a llevar. I was like, oh, it sounds like a good fruit. So it doesn't, doesn't scare me. You see, what I don't understand won't scare me. I was like, yeah, cucuy, bring te, 10 cucuys. Let's see what ki- we can do with that. Maybe a little soup and salada. I don't know, because... I think about fruit when it's a cuckoo. I don't know. If you're from the States, you, you have the boogeyman. I don't know because you guys like boogers. I don't know, you know. like You guys have to tell me. or It, it depends where you're from, right? But we're telling our children all these lies so they can obey us. One of the things that I despise is when people came to come to visit me and they bring little ones and then they're like running around and, and jumping on my beds and, and I'm going like twisting because this is not your house, first of all. And I'm like, oh, Susie is jumping on the bed. Susie, get off. Pastor Virginia is going to be mad. Why can't you just say, Susie, get off? It's not your bed. Do you see we're always trying to pass the responsibility on others without knowing. We do, it, we do it to our children, and then you grow up, and you still don't know why you don't like cats. I, I was telling in the first, um, I was telling in that first service, I was like, oh, Jesus, if I ever go to El Salvador, I know that cats live a long life, but by then, I'm pr- probably there in heaven. But I'm like, because I was very superstitious, I kicked Every, every cat that was black. <laughs> they tell you. Your parents tell you. These two told me. They don't like it, but they, they told me. <laughs> then they're going to be mad at me, but it's true. If it crosses you, kick it because you don't want it. You, you don't want it. You don't want the, the vibe. You don't want the bad things happening to you. Oh, I was so crazy. But anyways, I am saved now. Um, still being renewed. <laughs> I love cats. If you want to give me a cat, give me one. I'm on our rescue sharks and cats. But it's <laughs> Holy Spirit, come back. This didn't go like this at the 8 a.m., pr- I promise you. Okay, let us go to Isaiah 60, verse 1. Okay, let's bring back the shark, my husband said. Do not be afraid of sharks. That's your nugget for the day. Isaiah 60, verse 1 says, Arise from spiritual depression to a new life. Shine, be radiant, 
with the glory and brilliance of the Lord. For your light has come and the glory and the brilliance of the Lord has risen upon you. It's time to arise. It's time to shine. It's time to, to, to believe. What, what do we really believe? Why are we so afraid of, of obeying God? Why are you so afraid of um, if God tells you to do something and you still don't want to do it? You know, many times I remember coming to the Lord and, and I thought that w once you come to the Lord, you're exempted. It's like you get a pass, whole pass, and nobody bothers you, no sickness, no difficulties, no, no bad circumstances, and I felt like I was like a Girl Scout with a lot of things, you know? But you know, life is not like that. Life is hard. But we don't have to be afraid of, of the hardness of life because Jesus died for you on the cross and he paid a dear price for us to be cowards. And I can say that because you can read it in the Bible. And it's in Revelation 8. And I think it's verse 5. It says that those, the cowardly, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And, you know, cowardly is like we all have fear. See, we're, we're trying to fight fear. There's The point in all this is not to try to fight fear. No, we overcome fear. Um, when I used to uh, suffer a lot of uh, anxiety, um, I remember one time, and not too long ago, one tried to knock on my door. And if you ever had anxiety, anxiety will, anxiety is a liar. Like, no, it comes to lie. I think it's the voice of hell. Because it tells you, oh, you're, go you're, go you're going down. You're going to die. Da, 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 da. And so I, I remember just walking around, praying in the spirit, and I said, okay, Lord, stop. What is my reality? I have rights. Jesus died for me on the cross. What is my reality? What am I to do? And the Lord says, you need to confront that fear. And I said, well, how do I do that? Do I call the, do I call the ambulance? You know, that would be the easier way, right? He says, no, 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 no. You're going to walk around. And you're going to remind yourself who you are until that thing subsides. And I started for 30 minutes. I am the head and not the tail. I, do you feel like you're the head and not the tail? No. You feel like you're the tail and you're really stinky at the moment. But you start. You start. You need the word of God and you need to say, no, 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 no. God is with me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. I have great purpose. I, ha I went through everything, every, everything that God has said about me. I wet it. I said it I, over and over, over and over. And you would think that I would feel better. And I said, I don't care. I don't care. And if someone finds me passing out here in Stevenson's Ranch, so be it. Because you have to tell the devil that you're willing to stand because he wants to lie to you. And that's all he wants to convince you. He wants to convince you you're going down. You know what? You're never going to make it. Your family's never going to make it. Who told you you're going to make it? You should move states. Look, look what's happening. Next time it's going to be at the big earthquake in California. And now you're looking for a new home. And we allow the devil to kick us out of the places that we belong. And I'm tired. Believe me, I am tired. So I told the devil, the devil was like, uh, not today, buddy. That was me back then when it was easier for you to talk to me. But now I understand and I know the voice of my father and the voice of a liar I do not pay attention to. Then how come you're feeling shaky? Shut up. So what? That's my body dancing. Come up with witty ideas, you know? Don't let him bully you. Next verse. Doing good in time? Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 says this. 
Therefore, since we have surrounded by so, by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. It says, let us also. It doesn't say that he will lay it aside for you. It says that you are to lay it aside. Every weight and sin which clings, so what? Do you know our walk here on this earth is the burdens. It's almost like God has cut every, have you seen those people in chains, right? Because they've been in prison. Well, our chains are loose. But we're like the magnet that we're going around and the, and the bowls are behind us. Wherever we go. Okay, let, the, let them follow you. Let them follow you. Let them be close to you, but you don't pick them up. You don't hook up again with them. And he says, let us run with endurance. He says, let us run with endurance. The race that is set before us. Looking to who? Looking to the pastor? Looking to your leader? Looking to your boss? Looking to your gorgeous wife? Looking to your handsome husband? To your children? No, it says looking unto Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. So when the enemy comes and says, well, what faith do you have? You know what? You have no saying. You have no saying in my life. You have no saying in this jurisdiction. I actually have a founder, and his founder is Jesus, and he's my beginning, and he is my end, and he is my, in my between, and he never leaves me, and he never forsakes me, and I will not be afraid, and I will continue to run my race. Where was I? Looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for who the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured the cross. Circle the, the word endured. He has, says it like, I don't know how many times, endurance, endured. Despising the shame and, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Right now, do you know that whenever you feel lonely and you say, there's no one there for me. Do you know why Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father? Do you know why? To pray for you. Do you understand that we have someone to praying for you and I 24-7? You know what the prayer is? Father, let my children, let their faith not falter. Strengthen their faith. Strengthen their faith. So when the, the devil comes and lies to you, you know what? No one's there for me. No one has encouraged me. No, yes, yes, yes. Someone's there for you more real than yourself. His name is the Holy Ghost. And he is with us. It's just that we ignore him. And then we have someone who loves us, who is for us. His name is Jesus, and he is praying for us. And then we have a father who is in madly in love with you. He loves me so much, I don't even know why. Think about it. Have a moment one time and you ask God, God, how much do you love me? But honest, take five minutes. And I'm going to assure you that at the end of your five minutes, you will be overwhelmed in tears of the way that he loves you, that he never leaves you. We betray him. He never betrayed us. There are days that we don't even talk to him, and yet he's still with us. There's days that every day the Holy Spirit is there to help us, to guide us, and we don't even say, good morning, Holy Spirit. We call so-and-so. What should I do for the day? And he's still there for us. And knowing all this, Jesus continue is, and is continually praying for you and I so we are able to endure. I'm almost done. Verse 3 says, consider him who, Jesus, who endured again. From sinners 
such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. He says that he endured for you and I, for you and I. You know, some, I heard people say, well, like he, he endured it because he knew that in three days he was going to be in heaven. No, that wasn't it. No, he endured it because he saw you and me today. And he endured hostility. And sometimes we feel so alone and he felt everything, everything that you and I have gone through on this earth, he felt it a million times. Can you imagine he was, he had his 12 friends and he was, you know, teaching them. They were their disciples and they lived together and, and then one of them betrayed him. Have you ever been betrayed? How does it feel? It's painful. That was very low. It's painful. It's painful. And I thought, God, you are so awesome, Jesus. You are so awesome that you knew what this dude was going to do to you, and yet you chose him. And you did it because you weren't... You needed to experience betrayal so you can carry that for us. So if ever, if ever we get betrayed, we don't have to be damaged for life. And then he has all these 12 friends that they do life for 12 years together, breaking bread and doing life. And all of a sudden, there, there comes a day that they come and, and, and they're going to take him to prison. And then all of her homies, all of her friends just scattered. How would you feel if you, you have 12 girls or 12 boys, and then you say, you know, we're the, we're the puzzle. We're going to do this. And, and you even walk like crabs, you know, all back to each other. So nothing can happen to you, right? And you, somebody does something to you, they all turn like, you know, that, that's the way kind of Jesus had his his environment and then all of a sudden they're coming for him and they're going to crucify him and, 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 they're, and they're speaking lies about him and they're slandering him and they're, and they're calling him the son of the devil and his friends knew better but all of them scattered can you imagine the pain Has a friend ever abandoned you and talk all this crap? You can say that in church. All this lies and she slander, he slander you and he just put your name over the mud and then got another mud and another layer and then another layer. And he experienced that. And you know what? He was willing to endure it so you and I are not able to live a broken life on this earth. And you know what the word endurance means? Nobody likes the word endurance. The word endurance means bear up under, to bear under the weight off. The power, listen to this, the power to withstand great pain and hardship. The ability to continue despise fatigue, stress of adverse conditions. And this is the Greek translation. We go for a run and we're like, oh, we can't do it anymore. Endurance, right? We're living in times when nobody wants to endure. We want an instant gratification. I want a, an instant promotion. We don't like something, you know, I'm leaving. You get a new job and your boss didn't say good morning to you. You're like, I miss this. I'm a child of God deserving the best. Better yet, I'm going to have my own, I'm going to have my own um, company. No one wants to work with you because you are moody. Magoody. Magoody. 
And then that's, the, that's what we're teaching. You know, I have this for the other services, but not the best. Um, I believe that God comes and he, he gives us, um, like, he invites you for a feast, right? And then he's like, well, you have all the fruit here. Pre pretend these are good seeds. I don't, these are like sunflower seeds. I don't like them. But pretend these are cashews, whatever. Cashews, you name it, right? Cashews, another nut that you like. Not yourself, another one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we had all these nuts. You can put water, and this is um, and this is soil. And the Lord said, "Come, come, come! I want you to come, and I want you to choose. What would you choose if you will come here?" Uh, let's say t time is of the essence. Let's say three people. Okay, you, Anusha, the ones that I remember names. Uh, Christina. But quickly, help me. And Pammy. Okay, this is super delicious. I'm going to tell you, these are super, super delicious uh, seeds. Like the best seeds from all over the world. And I'm not going to give you the seeds. I'm going to provide you with the water. And I'm going to give you um, good soil. Okay, it's called Elevia soil. But this here, look at this fruit. You can have whatever you want. So what would you choose? Choose whatever you want. It, and here if you want. It's yours. Yeah. When, enjoy it. Okay, what would you like? Yeah. <laughs> Which seeds? Okay, take the seeds. If I take the seeds, I don't know if I give you all this manure. No, just kidding. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> and pretend that I gave you water. How about you, Pammy? What would you like? An almendra. She looks told me before, these were my cashews. <laughs> almendra. And you have some water. That's why I'm wearing this today, you know. I'm going to tell you something. The point to this is that most things that God gives us is in a form of a seed. But we, my friends, we want the fruit. Because if Pam got cashews, I don't know what she got. Pam is going to have to go take the soil, prepare the soil, water it, and I don't know how long it takes to to harvest cashews, right? And I think that's what we do. We want, we want God to give us, I want my blessing, I want my husband right now. Six pack. Blue eyes. Speaking tongues. And a good job. Good luck. Life doesn't work that way. And I believe that that's, that's what we do a lot of times. God gives us a promise, and we just want the fruit. But in order to have the fruit, something has to die. He gives you a seed, and that seed has to die. Maybe you have a seed of 
and forgiveness. You want to have an amazing marriage, but hey, you won't have it because that seed of unforgiveness has not, is not dead yet. And then that's not the harvest you want. What seed is it that God has given you in your hand? He's asking you, surrender that seed or surrender that area in your life that needs to be down, that you need to lay aside, you need to put away that sin. And you might say, Pastor, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian. How can you ask me about sin? Do you know what sin is? Sin is when God asks you to do something and you don't do it. Period. We think sin, sin is slandering, gossiping, and promiscuity, and you name it, all the big ones. They are sins. But in God's, there is no a middle sin, a baby sin, a toddler sin. Sin is sin. And I believe that God is asking you today, I want you to lay aside everything that has been holding you back because there's things that you've been carrying because you refuse to give them to me because you have allowed offense, you have allowed bitterness, and you have allowed disappointment. And there are other sins that God just asked you to do, but you just refuse to because you want to, you don't even like your own lane. There is someone here this afternoon that God says, she is not even happy with her own land. Well, my friend, you're going to stay there for a long time. And yes, you have that capacity in, in to change your lane. But you're never going to arrive and accomplish what God has for you. If today's message impacted you in any way, and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.